Thank you. Hi, my name is Jay Haig. Um, I'm Debug Steven on Twitter, if you're interested in following me. Um, I know there are a lot of folks here interested in functional programming, and people interested in functional programming seem to also be interested in writing Rust. That's really cool. Um, the question I hear most often from people is, um, why would I want to use Rust, or what should I build using Rust? Um, this talk is going to try to answer this question. So I'm going to start with a short language overview and then focus on ownership, what it is and how it works, and then talk about Rust type system a little bit as well. And then once we've considered the language design goals, then we'll answer what you might want to use Rust for. So welcome to my Rust Strike Force evangelism talk. Um, <laughs> Um, when you go to the official Rust website, you're greeted with this. A language empowering everyone to build reliable and efficient software. A previous iteration of this slogan was, the programming language that empowers everyone to become a systems programmer. I like the new slogan a little bit better because it very clearly encapsulates several different kinds of software. Um, when I first started learning Rust um, at a Rust bridge, um, which is a free workshop for underrepresented people in tech um, with a background in another programming language to learn Rust at RustConf. Um, it was branded to me as a um, programming language for systems programming. Um, and so I asked, um, what is considered systems programming? Um, and I was told, systems programming is everything, because everything is a system. And I really liked that idea. Um, so when I think of systems programming, I think of the ability to manage your own memory and resources and fast, fearless, concurrent programs. So uh, people say Rust is functional, and um, sort of, I guess. <laughs> it's a modern programming language um, that takes our favorite language features from other languages, um, and it's multi-paradigm. And I feel like it's mostly unopinionated in how you choose to write your code. Um, so Rust is just trying to help you get the code that you want to write written. And I think that's like one of the big appeals of Rust is that all of the language features that empower users to write logically correct code and um, have a more clear control flow of your program are because of the functional language features in Rust. So um, just to like review a little bit, like, what do we think of when we think of functional programming? Um, I think of these characteristics here. Um, and Rust tries to lead us to these by default. Um, and uh, at least with immutable data, and you have the ability to write to your functions, um, but it doesn't require us to. So. Uh, Rust is expression-based, and I was a little skeptical when I started um, like trying to write something like this. Um, so you could write this same function um, without the arrow returning um, unit and the unit at the end on the last line there, uh, because it will implicitly evaluate to a unit. So Another feature in Rust, this is from the Rust book um, from the variables and mutability chapter. Um, if you don't declare a variable um, with the mute keyword in front of it, um, so like let mute x equal five, um, you tr and you try to like reassign it without saying that it's a mutable variable, you're going to get this error. Cannot assign twice to a mutable variable x. So that's nice, right? Um, and then another thing that Rust has is abstract data types and pattern matching. Um, a simple example here is that we have an enum with a couple of different variants. And matching on those variants, we are able to say like what value those coins have in as a U8. So that's cool. Um, we can do more complicated things, too. So this is an enum from Rust doc. Um, and what this enum does is it just holds um, every single value in a crate that you would use to like, generate documentation for. Um, and so, like in this function, on the 
simple item line in the middle there. Um, you can even like destructure your data and um, do even more checks on it before like getting to the final branch there. So I think that's really awesome. That enables us to write so many different things. And then another language feature in Rust is the ability to write um, traits, which are like type classes in Haskell, similar. Um, so we can generalize um, any sorts of things over like several different um, data structures. So uh, why, why would you want to like use Rust? Um, well, it's blazingly fast, memory safety and thread safety. Um, and like, you can think of like some use cases already for it. Um, like on the Rust website, it shows um, command line applications, WebAssembly, networking, embedded systems, um, mostly systems programming adjacent topics, WebAssembly being somewhat of an exception because one of the major use cases of it is to write a faster, more reliable browser executable code. Um, it's pretty awesome if you haven't checked it out. So, um, I don't know if everyone can see the underlined red part, so I'm going to uh, also read it out. Um, the parts that I am most interested in focusing on are, wait, the blazingly fast and memory efficient with no runtime or garbage collector um, under the performance section there, and under reliability, a rich type system and ownership model guarantee memory safety. Um, and so, when I think of functional programming languages, I think of them all as being garbage collected. Um, and like, I, I went through and like looked at a whole bunch of different ones. Um, and wait, it makes sense that FP languages generally have a garbage collector because between all of the lexical closures and freedom of passing references around by having all of your data be immutable, it becomes really difficult to reason about how long, what resources will be held by what components. And a garbage collector just lets you not have to think about that, and you can focus on just writing your logic instead. So I'm going to like try to, or, and also, um, when, I, when I was like researching this talk, I found out that um, Lisp used to have a manual memory management, and <sighs> So that's where that came from. Thanks, Functional Programming, for giving us garbage collection. Um, and we don't really want to manage our own memory like, uh, like in C, because we're not really great at it. Uh, we like double free or any other sort of problems that are just going to cause memory issues. So, um, oh, no. Uh, Re this is a little bit related to resource management. I'll try to tie it together. Um, so Rust has a few monadic interfaces, like the maybe monad and error monad with the option and result type. Um, it's a little less ergonomic than monad and Haskell. Um, and I want to explain why Rust doesn't have generic monads. So um, we, we just talked about the benefit of having a garbage collector um, and like how it allows us to focus on logic and not worry about resources. Um, but in Rust, it's really important to keep track of our resources. So Boats has this great thread on why we would do async await instead of do notation. Um, and there are a few relevant points that I'm going to like summarize from that thread. So how would you solve keeping track of your resources while using an interface like Haskell's monadic bind operator. It's a really hard problem, and I don't think it's possible without introducing a lot of complexity to the language. So if Rust had monads, we wouldn't be able to borrow resources in a do block, for example. Um, and then there are other things like um, Rust is also imperative, so we have return and break, and those just wouldn't make much sense instead of like a do block. And of course, there are currently no higher kinded types and probably will never be higher kinded polymorphism. Um, and so generalized monads just 
don't really fit with the design goals, I think, of what Rust is meant to be used for. Um, but here's an example of the maybe monad in action um, with the option type. Um, you can see here that uh, you can chain operations and that it will terminate uh, and not like allow you to use the null value, which I'm sure a lot of people understand the pain of accidentally <laughs> using a null and getting a null pointer exception. And um, the error monad also um, allows us to handle side effects, so it's very useful. So back to this question, like what should I use Rust for? So these functional features that we've just talked about um, help us control the flow of our program and focus on the logic. Um, and, you know, it may be a little bit important since, like, when we're writing code, hopefully we'll tell the computer to do the right thing. So now that we've done, like, a quick overview of those features, um, let me actually, like, talk about what you might want to use Rust for. So I'm currently writing Haskell professionally, and a lot of my coworkers know I'm interested in Rust. So oftentimes they'll ask me, uh, what should I use Rust for? Uh, my answer is usually, eh, I don't know, uh, programs where you care about performance or find control over your resources, which just doesn't satisfy them. But come on, like, those were the features that the website highlighted, right? Um, so, like, coming at it from a different perspective, like, how does Rust provide, like, the same niceties that functional languages do without garbage collection? Um, why would anyone interested in functional programming want to learn Rust or use it? Um, Rust has a similar expressivity to Haskell, and that's something I really love about it. Um, so let's talk about this problem of resource management that Rust has solved here. Um, so there's this thing called ownership, and the ownership model is how Rust keeps track of its resources. Um, and so we have just talked about how some languages have garbage collection that constantly looks for no longer used memories that they can deallocate. Um, and then we have manually, mem manually memory managed languages where you must explicitly allocate and free your memory. Um, and Rust does something entirely different. Um, memory is managed through a system of ownership with a set of rules that the compiler checks at compile time and none of the ownership features slow your program down while it's running. Um, so here are the rules for ownership. Um, each value in Rust has a logical owner. There can only be one owner at a time, and when the owner goes out of scope, the value will be dropped. Um, and the way those rules are enforced are by the borrow checker. The borrow checker is a static analysis tool that figures out if borrows are valid. Um, And those variable bindings are live until they're used. Um, and then after use, either ownership is transferred or the value is dropped. Um, and there was a pretty recent improvement to the borrow checker. Um, so the mirror borrow check um, tweaked how the rules were enforced, making it easier for Rust developers to understand how the ownership rules were being enforced in their code. It fixed a handful of borrow checker bugs, um, and before this um, fix, variables were live for their whole scope, um, even if they were manually dropped. And one of the other additions in the mirror borrow check is that um, it supports non-lexical lifetimes. Um, these are lifetimes that are based on the control graph control flow graph rather than lexical scopes. Um, and then like, to quickly explain what a lifetime is, um, a lifetime is a span of time before a value goes permanently out of scope. And a lifetime is also the span of time in which a reference can be used. Um, and the compiler will infer the lifetime to be the smallest lifetime that it can possibly have um, while still encompassing all the uses of that reference. Um, and so there's also uh, the drop checker. And what the drop checker does is it determines the order that your resources should be dropped. Um, and the rules for that are 
uh, the first two bullet points on this slide. So um, variables are dropped in the reverse order that you declare them, and fields are dropped recursively from the outermost type to the innermost type. So I want to talk about the process of taking your Rust source code to machine executable code um, to then like talk about uh, the type system and say a little bit more about borrow checking. So the ownership model has been called a static garbage collector by Steve Klabnik. Um And garbage collection usually happens at runtime. Um, so here, though, we see our Rust code when we compile our Rust code, it is first parsed and desugared, and we get a higher level intermediate representation. Um, and then we do our type checking on that higher level intermediate representation and get a middle intermediate representation. And on that middle, we um, analyze that Rust code with the borrow checker and drop checker. Um, so you see the borrow checking stuff there, and then it's optimized. LVM happens and a little bit more optimization. So. Uh, Rust type system takes ideas from substructural type systems. And um, substructural type systems are a family of type systems where we're more, one or more of the structural rules are absent or only allowed under certain circumstances. Um, another way to say that would be, essentially, these type systems define how many times a value may be used. Um, systems like these are really useful con for constraining access to system resources, such as files, locks, memory, by keeping track of the state that occurs and preventing invalid states. Um, so oftentimes I hear people say that Rust has affine types, and that's also what Wikipedia says. Um, Rust sure does have some fine types, but it doesn't have affine types exactly. <laughs> the, the type system uses a combination of use rules to enforce particular language semantics. So um, in substructural type systems, we have uh, three operations here. Um, that a type might support. And uh, we care about two of these. So we care about um, can be used at most once um, for weakening. Um, you can see that in the use column. And um, can be used at least once, which is contraction. And um, Ankra has written a post on why Rust doesn't have linear types, um, which is like also relevant to this, because people often think that uh, linear and affine are synonyms, but they are not exactly, as you can see here. Uh, so like, how do you define a use? Um, Rust kind of plays around with it a bit. Um, a lot of... Like, a lot of what we care about doing with the type system is making it do things that we actually want it to do. Um, so the way that a use is defined is a couple of different ways, and we'll see that as we go through the different semantics that Rust supports. Um, so out of all these, again, like, can be used any number of times is just the default. Um, can't be used more than once is an affine type system. Um, must be used at least once is relevant must be used exactly once is linear. Um, and again, like linear or affine are sometimes used as synonyms for the whole substructural system type system, but that is not exactly correct. So um, to, Rust does support any number of uses um, with its copy and clone semantics. So, um, Rust has a bitwise copy for all primitive types by default because it's very cheap, um, and it means that you can't uh, call drop on them. And most types in Rust can implement clone. Clone is a way to perform a deep copy. Um, 
can't be used more than once is how Rust has move semantics and ownership. Um, so the way that Rust defines a use here is to be passed by value. And the purpose of that is to, the purpose of this system is that it gives us a way to simply prove that we have unique access to a value. Um, if you have a move only type by value, you know that no one else is looking at it and that it's safe for you to do something that invalidates it, like freeing a pointer it owns. Um, this also gives us fairly strong aliasing guarantees for immutable references and helps us avoid a ton of logic bugs. Um, there are some drawbacks to AFIN types. Um, if you have hidden global state, um, you can have some bugs still. So uh, most types don't really have this problem because they generally own all the context they care about. Um, another bug move only types can't prevent is forgetting to do something. So in this code example, um, we can make sure that you perform step one before step two, but we can't actually make sure that you do step two, um, which brings us to another kind of type, relevant types. So uh, these types must be used at least once. And Rust has Lewis's support for this type, and um, we see it in unused variables and drop. Um, like unused variables are pretty indicative that you've accidentally created an implementation bug. Um, so it's very nice that um, Rust will warn you when you haven't used it. And uh, simply binding it to a variable will make it OK. Um, drop provides stronger support for must use values by um, introducing a final step that will be called automatically on a value um, as it's dropped. Um, wait, it doesn't matter what you do, like assigning to a variable, printing it, stuffing it in a collection, or calling panic. Um, drop will almost always be called. Um, there is um, one cool hack. Um, one way that you can avoid um, drop is uh, using memforget and um, implementing drop as um, a board. So if, if you want to write some cursed code, you could go try to do memforget and try to make Rust not drop. Um, so Rust doesn't have complete support for this type, but it has a little bit. Um, and then linear types must be used exactly once. Um, Rust doesn't actually support this type at all. And um, people that like really want this um, are looking for like proper support of relevant types. So what should I use Rust for? <laughs> uh, when you have a language that syntactically feels like a functional language with a type system that empowers you to have granular control of your resources, um, Rust will remind you that you don't own a value. Um, if you don't care about resource management, Rust is still a fine choice. Um, a lot of what was discussed in this talk so far empowers developers to write logically correct programs. Um, however, uh, there are a lot of languages that do that, and so that's not really unique to Rust. Um, here's like a list of stuff that has actually been built with Rust. Um, like some things that I have contributed to um, are the Dalek cryptography crates, um, Tower, which is a networking library, um, tracing a, it's a logging library, but uh, it, the, the author would also like to say that it is not a logging library because she is very funny. Um, there's also Rust Wasm, uh, the WebAssembly bindings for Rust, and RustDoc, the Rust documentation generation tool. Um, and I've made like simple web apps, quick command line applications. Um, there's just so many, so much stuff written in Rust. Um, there is an entire repository dedicated to all of this, all of the cool stuff written in Rust. Um, it does not all fit, fit on this slide even. Um, it, this list is so long, it is split into three categories. <sighs> Applications, development tools, and libraries. 
Um, if you're looking for cool projects written in Rust, um, you'll likely find it here. And if you don't, you should add it to the list. Um, but this might spark some ideas um, for like some first projects that you might want to try out. Um, and then, what hasn't been built with Rust? Well, thankfully, this list is a little bit shorter. And also, um, this repository has some really great information laid out to describe what exactly um, would be useful to implement and add to the ecosystem. So some of these are um, just like some major features that um, would be great to add to some existing projects. And then some of these are not implemented at all. So if you're looking for a challenge and want to add something useful to Rust, that's a nice place to start. Um, I think there are a few other reasons to write Rust besides um, just ownership and memory safety. Um, for me, Rust was a way to um, write. I, I am a co-author of the X25519 Dalek crate, um, and I implemented the Diffie-Hellman API in that crate. Um, I'm not a cryptographer. Um, I feel like Rust, because of ownership and the rules that it gives us for memory safety guarantees, um, that it really does enable you to like uh, enter topics that you may not have domain expertise in um, because of the careful management of memory that you have the ability to write in Rust. Um, so like if I had tried to write that in a different language like C++ or one where it's more difficult to know the state of your resources, it would have been really difficult for me and I wouldn't have felt very confident about my code. Um, and then, of course, I, Rust is very well known for its friendly community. And um, something that matters quite a bit to me is that they support underrepresented people in tech. Um, they have a Rust bridge, which is, as I mentioned earlier, a free workshop directed at underrepresented people in tech. And they have a code of conduct, which makes me feel really safe and good. Um, and both of those things made it so much easier for me to jump in and start contributing to projects because I could just focus on the tech. So without RustBridge, I probably wouldn't be here presenting today on Rust. So I'd like to give a big thank you to everyone who has ever run a RustBridge. And I would encourage you to run your own if you're interested, because I really do, I really do believe it has quite a large positive impact. So thank you so much.